satisfying to see all that. Uh, Irving Penn did several uh, photo shoots with Miles Davis. Uh, I think this, this actually became an album cover for Miles Davis, but, but he, he did a whole series of, uh, of the hands, and you know, there's a whole bunch with the trumpet and everything too. But again, it's that, that, that range of tones from pure white to pure black and everything in between. And look how much it reveals. I mean, you can see all the, all the little textures and everything that, that are making the, the lines on his palm, on his fingers. Uh, and, but, but he comes out of the, the background and it's just, you know, it's this face appearing out of the, out of the, out of the background and it's got this intensity to it. Uh, here, Mapplethorpe shows us the whole calla lily, but it, it ranges from, again, that, you know, right here in the stem where it's all shadowed, it's, it's as black as the background, but then there's all those other subtle little things happening. I mean, look at all the little details that, uh, so that you can see the bloom, and there's, and there's no color there. He, he did some in color, which I thought about putting in here, but I decided that the, the color ones don't repro reproduce as well, uh, uh, or at least the ones that I could find images of just don't re reproduce as well as the black and white. Uh, light can be used for dramatic or emotional effect. Uh, three paintings by Caravaggio, uh, which are all about the, uh, the conversion of St. Matthew, uh, and the, they're in this little chapel in the uh, uh, San Luigi de Fran Franceschi in Rome, which is a, basically, it's, it just means it's the French church in Rome. And uh, the, when you go in there, when this was painted, the only artificial light was, was either the sunlight coming through the window or it was it was a torch or a candle, and of course now, now they've got lights in. You can you can take your you can take your you know one one euro coin and drop it in the in the light box off to the side. In fact, it, it might be that that little white box right there. Drop your your money in that little white box to the side, and for a minute, all these spotlights come on and show up, show you all these paintings, and. And when I take the students in there, it's, it's like, no, don't, don't put any money in the box. Uh, let your eyes adjust for a minute. Get used to the light in there, just like Caravaggio got used to the light in there. And then look at, you know, and they're surrounding you. This is, this is what's in front of you, but this is on your right and this is on your left. And you're in this, this, this kind of darkened room and here are these figures just coming out of the darkness at you uh, because, because the, you, it's hard to tell where the painting ends and the room begins because it's, it's kind of dark in there. And, but these figures are popping out because they're so bright in that space that it's full of action. There's all, it's, it's full of movement even though they're just painted flat still images. Uh, and after you've looked at it like that, you can really understand what Caravaggio was doing because he was, he was one of the first ones to really use the idea of, of dark shadows and that contrast. Before then, everybody painted things and it was all, it was all bright colors almost everywhere. And, uh, and he, he wanted to use shadows. He wanted that drama to come out uh, because it was going in a kind of dark church, a dark building. And, and now, you know, in the 20th and 21st century, you go in, you pop your money in, so, you know, every, everybody comes for tours. First things tourists do is they come in, they pop their money in so they can see it all brightly lit, which Caravaggio never would have seen it that way. He didn't paint it for you to see it that way, but, uh, but we have to see it that way. Uh, Bernini 
uh, who did that, that sculpture of David, he was an architect as well. He uh, did, did a whole bunch of St. Peter's uh, and a lot of other things as, as well as being a, a sculptor. But he, this is for uh, a small church. It's even smaller than uh, the, uh, uh, the, the San Francesco in Rome. It's, it's, it's in Rome. It's other side of town. But uh, it's, it's this little, little church, and he did this sculpture. Uh, and he, he could spend the time on it because he'd been working with, with a pope, and, and the pope had died, and they, the new pope didn't really like him. So he, he, he wasn't doing any more work for the pope that year. So he had time. Uh, a cardinal commissioned this, and the cardinal lived in a palazzo around the corner from this church, and he wanted, uh, uh, he wanted this, this church that he went to all the time to have, have something by Bernini. And uh, so he commissioned Bernini to do a sculpture of the ecstasy of uh, St. Teresa. And if you read Teresa's accounts of it, uh, it all sounds like, you know, some, some sexual experience. Uh, and, but it, but it's, it's about her conversion to being, to being you know, un, a bride of Christ, and the story goes that she had this this vision of this uh, this angel coming down with this golden golden arrow and, and piercing her breast, and and she describes all this 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 wonderful pleasure she had uh, at being able to be uh, at, at at being pierced like that, and so Bernini, you know he, he you know he, he reads. He reads her words and and he says, "Well, I've got to show how she's feeling, while at the same time, I've got to make it look so it's 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 not quite so crude as, uh, you know, the, uh, the the physical nature of of the act of sex." Uh, so he sets it up as a, a stage play. Now this shot is shot down low. When you're in the church, you can't see this, this stained glass window that has all this yellow glass in it and white glass. Uh, it's out of sight. And, and you can't see it from outside the church. It's only up <coughs> towards the roof. Uh, but the light comes in, and he directs the light. He has all these gilt bronze rays coming down, basically, from heaven uh, on the wall. Uh, there's green marble is what's what's backing it. So here's all this 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 shiny gold and the light from the uh, the skylight is coming down. You can't see the light though. You I mean you can't see the window itself. You can only see the light reflected. Uh, this is what you see when you when you're in the church in the chapel, and so it's all shining on there like a spotlight on a stage uh, when you're watching a play, <coughs> and it's it's. And that's exactly what it is. It's drama. He's saying, look at what's happening here. It's, it's, this, it's this spiritual stage play about her ecstasy. And, you know, she's got her head thrown back in, in ecstasy. And, you know, the, look at the, the sumptuous, wonderful folds of the, the drapery everywhere. And there's, there's not an awful lot of, of flesh showing. So, so, so we know it's, it's not... It's not common sex. It's 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 spiritual, but uh, when you read her words, it's it's talking like like it could be. And I, I didn't put the pictures in, but just on the outside of uh, of each of these, and this is sitting back in the chapel. Maybe uh, well, the sculpture itself is about this big. The, the walls of the chapel. It's it's not very deep. It's you know, we have walk-in closets that are probably bigger than this chapel. Uh, maybe not the same ceiling height. But sitting out here on this side and sitting out here on the other side are, there are more marble carvings. And, and it's built into the architecture of the church. It's, they're like, they're like an audience in, in, a, in a theater. And it's, they're all portraits of the cardinal and his family. 
and they're all looking at this. And you know, a couple of them are actually turned. One of them's turned and whispering in one of them's ear, saying, "Oh, you know," and, and pointing down there. You know, like, "Oh, look, look what's happening down there." And and so it's all about it's all about making it it be like a stage play. Uh, it's 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 drama. It's not just a piece of sculpture. It's he set up the whole thing like it's like it's on stage. Uh, and it wouldn't work without that, that light that's coming down that you can't see the source of. Uh, Joseph Millard Turner, uh, no, I'm fine, thank you. Uh, British artist that, that got real caught up in the idea of, of nature at its, at its worst and the drama of nature. So, Here's the, here's the explosion of Krakatoa in, in East Java uh, in the 18, 1880s. Here's, uh, here's a storm. Uh, and these are big canvases. They're, uh, his, they're, they're almost as tall as, uh, as the ceiling here, and they're, they're maybe uh, from here to the door. They're big canvases. They're, uh, so you stand in front of them, and you're just, you're just knocked away at how big they are and what's happening. Because there's all these swirls and uh, intense colors and stuff, and it's all that light is a metaphor for for just how powerful nature is. And then you come in, you know, you look at some of Ansel Adams pieces, and he's he's he, he doesn't have quite the fury and, the, and tempestuousness. Uh, na nature's a little bit calmer in most of his photographs, but it's still just as big and powerful. Uh, you can't help but be just blown away by the, the sheer vista that you're seeing there and the drama of it with the, 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 the white lights and the dark shadows. Uh, bring it back down to earth. Mapplethorpe photographs two models, one black, one white. They both have shaved heads and he's saying, you know, look at Look at how different they are, but they're the same. And he's playing off that 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 light because they've got this, you know, the, the light shining on them, how the light hits them, uh, and and saying they're they're both in in this world's light together. Uh, Light can be used as a symbol or, or metaphor. Uh, again, I, I kind of was, was talking about Caravaggio and, and St. Matthew, but here's one of the images there. This is when St. Matthew is there with, with his, his friends. They've been playing cards, and, and suddenly he's struck by, by, by a knowledge of, uh, of, of God, of Christ. And and so he's and that's what the light stands for. It's it's like, whoa, you know, it just hit me, and and his life changes right then. Uh, George de la Torre, he's he's taking uh, this this is this is supposed to be the Magdalene. Uh, she's uh, she's. She's she's got a, a red a red uh, skirt on you know a white shift uh, again it's the the red is saying you know she's very much part of this physical world that that red stands for being being in the physical world uh, symbolic she's got a she's got a skull sitting on her lap she's got books with knowledge on the table uh, the only light is this candle has got this flame it's it's. The candle's not very, very big. It's, it's going to bur burn out pretty soon. Uh, so she's, she's contemplative. She's thinking there, and it's, it's, it's basically, it's saying, again, whoever is looking at this painting when this was painted knows what all these symbols mean, and it's, it's a, it's a parable. It's a story saying, you, you, you better think about, about your. Uh, you, you better think about your your soul, your spiritual side, because 
it's, it's not going to be long, no, no matter how beautiful you are right now, uh, it's not going to be long before you're, you're, just that, you're just that skull just like you have on your lap right now. It's all about, uh, you know, vanity and death. Uh, and, and the light of the candle both stands for, for life, but it also stands for the, the everlasting life that, that is supposed to be through, through religion. And, of course, remember, most, almost everything was coming through the, uh, through the lens of the, the, the idea of the church. So it was all about religion. <laughs> uh, Dwayne Michaels, uh, 1968, uh, did, I, I remember he came, when I was an art student, he came and gave a presentation at the school where I was. And... Uh, I, I just remember being fascinated with a lot of his his work and his images, and uh, uh, I don't remember very much about him as a person. We did a workshop. I mean, he came into the photography room and we we talked and you know critiqued some of the photographs and stuff. Uh, that is kind of just a blur, but I, I remember being really struck by by his photographs, and this was one that I really liked back then. Uh, and basically, you know, he. he came in in the dark room and he played and uh, uh, dodged it so that, uh, so that the face uh, is just this, this, this glowing thing, which, uh, which just, you know, to me it was like, yeah, yeah, I, I know how that feels sometimes. Not, maybe not as bright as that, but somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, Dan Flavin, uh, in 1963, was one of the first artists that started coming in and using light as the subject of his, of his work. Uh, but it's also, it, it's symbolic, it stands for something. This is uh, two different installation variations of the sculpture that he, which started him on his, the, the rest of his career until he died just a couple years ago. He kept working with with uh, fluorescent and neon lights. And in this case, it's you know just a regular fluorescent light like you see above you. He stuck one in there, he put two here, and three over there. One, two, three. And, and it's called the nominal three to William of Ockham. And if you're not familiar, William of Ockham was a philosopher uh, in the uh, 14th century who basically postulated that uh, don't make anything more complex than it needs to be. It can be a simple, you know, a simple statement. It's Occam's razor is uh, often it's misspelled, but uh, it's Occam's razor. It's saying, you know, don't look for really strange, uh, you know, explanations for things if there's a simpler one that's available because it's almost always the case that the simplest the simplest reason for something to happen is the one that's probably going to be whatever caused it and in this case the nominal three you've got that's all you need to understand everything that goes beyond three one two three it's a series it, it, that's, and, and you know, then you've got that one, two, three, dot, 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 the little ellipsis. And everybody knows what that means. You know, you, you follow that order and you take things through to wherever they lead you, but it's all going to be in sequence. Uh, motion. The, uh, how does the artist represent motion? Uh, it's, it's an important thing. I mean, we, we move. We, uh, we have to move around. We have to uh, do things to, to fulfill our lives. Uh, but how do, you, how do you capture the idea of motion? Uh, again, here's Bernini again in a life-size sculpture of uh, the mythical uh, characters from Greek mythology, Apollo and Daphne. And uh, Daphne was a, a, a wood nymph, a, a mortal, not, not, not a god or a goddess. Uh, and of course, Apollo is, is the sun god. And like 
like a lot of, a lot of young men, uh, young gods, uh, the, uh, they, they, they are attracted to, to beautiful female form. And he catches uh, Daphne in the woods, and he's, he's running after her to have, uh, have his way with her. And she appeals to the gods above, and they don't do something as crude as just, you know, they, they can't really stop Apollo from doing what he wants to do, but they can make it so he might not want to do what he wants to do. And so they, they, they don't just magically whisk her away someplace, they, they turn her into a tree. And so here's the moment, just as he's catching up with her, just as he's about to rape her, uh, she starts turning into a tree. Her, her fingers are sprouting into branches and leaves. Uh, her, her torso's becoming a trunk. And uh, that kind of leaves Apollo, you know, you, you can imagine how, how upset he's going to be in just a second when he realizes that uh, he's, he's going to have to solve his, uh, his, his ardor some, some other, other way. And it's that frozen moment in time that we're looking at. We're seeing that, 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 that brief instant when you, you, you can imagine what came before, you can imagine what's going to happen next, but, but we're, we're frozen right here. Uh, fast forward uh, several centuries, uh, Edward Mybridge, uh, he got interested in, uh, he had been a, a, a doing some painting and stuff, but then he got interested in, he had, uh, uh, he'd been in a, a stagecoach accident, hurt his head, and, uh, and he's, to, as, he, as he was trying to recover from that, he, he took up the, the idea of photography, which was a, a brand new process at the time. Uh, this was in early 1860, 1861, and he got really interested in uh, the idea of capturing capturing motion, uh, capturing it aesthetically, and one of his uh, one of his patrons who put up some money uh, was a uh, uh, owned a a racehorse uh, called called Sally Gardner, and the uh, there was a lot of controversy at the time in the race, racing circles about whether or not a horse's four hooves were all off the ground at the same time when it was running. And that there, were, there were people that thought it was, there were people that thought it wasn't, but nobody could prove it one way or the other. And so he, he gave Mybridge uh, enough money so that Mybridge could go out and, and basically what he did is he he got a whole slew of cameras all lined up in a row and he used trip wires, he, he used like stroboscopic lights, uh, mostly trip wires I think, but it was all different cameras, it wasn't the same camera. And then he had he had somebody run run past it. He painted the wall behind behind where the, all the cameras were. He divided it up nice and evenly and, and gradated it in numbers so that it became a grid. And, and then he had the jockey ride the horse pass all the cameras and the cameras went off one, two, three, four, five. Just like uh, Dan Flavin's uh, nominal three. And when it all got developed, uh, it showed that uh, all, four, all four hooves were off the ground at the same time. And, and it was also about when, when people depicted horses in paintings that were galloping, they, they always showed two back legs and two front legs going out. And uh, uh, so they decided that, uh, they, they realized here that it wasn't quite like they thought it was, but uh, but basically, it, so he, he won his bet, anyhow. Uh, the, uh, fast forward a, a few years, the, uh, you know, Henri Cartier-Bresson 
shows you know that 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 guy leaping over the puddle so that his he, his feet won't get wet. He's gone over this this sort of little ladder as a and and but it, it doesn't look like he's going to make it. It looks like he's going to get wet in just a second. But he's forever frozen up there, so so he's not wet. And uh, Shirley MacLaine is is out on the beach and. Uh, Jumping up in the air, just as uh, Philippe Halsman shoots shoots her photograph, and so these are about motion and movement uh, from the photographer's standpoint. I mean, you've got you've got you know if, if you've got a enough light and uh, and your film's fast enough, you can you can capture and freeze that moment, uh, which implies all that movement that that is in there. Uh, a painter. It might look really odd for a painter to take either one of those subjects and try to paint it uh, because it might not be as, as believable. But when it's a photograph, it's like, okay, I've got to believe it. It's, it's, it's got to be true. Uh, but remember, it's all a lie. But uh, I mean, that's what Photoshop is about, right? Anyhow, Marcel Duchamp uh, paints in 1912. Uh, new descending a staircase number two, and he's trying to capture everything that happens as that that figure walks down the stairs. You know, very stylized, obviously, but uh, uh, it created a lot of controversy at the time. I mean, I, I, I remember seeing a cartoon in one of the newspapers reproduced that said uh, uh, it looked like. Uh, an exploding box of match matchsticks. Uh, Elliot Elisafon, I'm not sure how you pronounce that last name, uh, gets in 1952, uh, he gets Marcel Duchamp to, in a time lapse uh, photography, he, he gets him to come down a staircase. And that's on the front cover of Life magazine, and uh, so it's 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 talking about what Duchamp had done, and at the same time, it's saying, "Look at what we can do, you know, with a photograph." Of course, it had, it had been done before, but this was, you know, the cover of Life magazine it sells it sells magazines. Uh, photographers knew knew everything that had been done before, but if you weren't interested in photography, you may not have ever. Realized what uh, what this was about. Uh, Gerhard Richter, in in the 1960s, just a couple of years after that Life magazine, uh, he used a camera to photograph women coming downstairs, and basically and froze them. Then, from the photograph, he painted two paintings uh, of each one. So it's it's kind of flipping things back around. It's, uh, you know, it, it's not just, it's, 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 it's a painting emulating uh, or, or copying, <coughs> copying a photograph uh, to, to get the idea of, of the, the movement coming down the stairs. And so he's using painter's techniques, but at the same time he's, he's using something that is done in the photograph. You get a little bit of blurring uh, around the edges. They're not sharp and crisp and clear because of that movement. Texture is the tactile surface quality, the thing that, that you can feel uh, with, with your skin, with your uh, fingers. Actual texture is, is something you can physically feel, uh, whether it's on the surface of a, a piece <coughs> of canvas or if it's just the visual texture, uh, such as in a photograph, you, you might see a lot of texture, but you run your hand over it and it's going to be perfectly smooth. Uh, uh, Floris van Dyck, uh, or Dick, I'm not sure how you pronounce that. My, 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 uh, my Dutch is not very good. Uh, still life with cheeses. And, uh, and it was, it was done in a series. Uh, they uh, painted several different versions of it, and 
I believe this particular one is called day, uh, day 30. So it was set up for 30 days, and he's trying to capture the, uh, uh, the texture of the, the, the cheeses and everything after they'd been sitting there for uh, 30 days. Uh, looks a little bit fresher than that, but it, it said day 30 anyhow. Uh, but look at how, how carefully it's all rendered. So you can imagine you know, going and uh, you know, taking a bite out of that apple or the pear. Uh, there's the nuts there, the walnuts. There's the, the hard cheese. The, and of course, I realize you all don't eat lots and lots of cheese in China, but uh, uh, we eat a lot in, in Western Europe. And, uh, that you see the wheels of cheeses and, and you know immediately that this is a relatively soft cheese, whereas this one was a, an, an aged uh, kind of hard cheese. And uh, they, there are rules when, you know, when I go to Italy, the, I've had Italians tell me, uh, no, you can't, you know, you, we, we would get a, a little round, of, half a round of cheese that would last us for the three months or so that we'd be there. And um, the, uh, it's pecorino, it's a sheep's milk cheese. And uh, my wife was trying to buy some uh, figs because she wanted to have figs and, and pecorino cheese because there's the sweet and the kind of salty. And uh, the little man that she was buying the figs from said, no, 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 you, you, can't, you can't have figs with pecorino. You have, you have pears with pecorino. Uh, said swigs are, figs are the wrong flavor. Uh, anyhow, uh, in a photograph here, you know, it's not, not edible, obviously, but we've got all these ceramic uh, building blocks uh, with the Eiffel Tower in the distance, and it's like you, you know what they're going to feel like if you reached out and touched them. The, uh, uh, the you know, the, the texture of the ends, the hollow ends there, and then the, the there they, they've all been made by extruding uh, through through these molds, and so they're they're all the same. And visually, it makes this really graphic, interesting pattern that's that's echoed by the shapes the, of the iron in the in the Eiffel Tower in the background. The uh, wind bullet photographed, you know, I'm not even sure where it was, but he, he calls it erosion. And you can see, you know, the, the roots of the trees hanging down, uh, and it's not going to be too long. You know, every once in a while you see there's, there's a tree that's fallen. But look at the, you can see there's a lot of rocks embedded in the, in the soil at, at that level right there. And it's, it's all been revealed by the, the, the water washing down and washing the soil away. Sometimes texture is used to really make you, the viewer, think about what's going on. Uh, Merritt Oppenheim was having, was having lunch with Picasso and Man Ray and a few other of the Surrealists one time in Paris, and she had a, she had a bracelet on that was made out of fur. And Picasso, you know, said something to her, said, she, you know, the, uh, you can, you can cover almost anything in fur, can't you? And, uh, and Merritt Oppenheim said, uh, yeah, I could even cover this teacup and, this, and this, this spoon in it. And within a couple of weeks, they, there was uh, uh, an opportunity to be in a big surrealism, surrealism show, and, uh, and, and that's what she put in. And, and it was the, one of the hits of the show because it's so, at the same time, it's so sensual, and, and you think about that, and you, and you think about what a teacup and a teaspoon is used for, and, you, and just the idea of putting that into your mouth, it's just, it's, it, it makes you, it, it's, it's so wrong <laughs> that, uh, that you, you remember it. It's, it's, it's a very strong, strong feeling. Pattern, uh, a repeated motif that's used to create rhythm, uh, and 
and energy in, in a piece of work. Uh, the you know, an example of an Acoma Indian uh, water jar from the 1920s, and there's there's some pattern working in there. Uh, it's very very lively. Uh, it's anonymous. We don't know you know who it was that made it. Uh, but another Acoma Indian uh, who is still alive uh, made made this, and she's. She's not using strictly traditional designs. She's using designs that come from her, her, her culture's tradition, but she's, she's changing the shape of the vase itself, and she's doing a design that has a lot more to do with, uh, with maybe op art, a very geometric form, than, uh, than is traditional, because it, usually that that spiral shape wouldn't go off the edge of the off the edge of the form. It would be in, usually in bands going around. Uh, Bill Brandt again, just looking at you know sky lightens over the suburbs. I mean, uh, you know, get in a helicopter and fly up above Johns Creek, and I imagine imagine you'd see some very similar things to that at some of the. Uh, some of the subdivisions you'd fly over, not not necessarily all, obviously. Some of them have a lot more room. Than, but and then again, Ansel Adams dunes again there, which was I showed you before. But it's in this case, and before I was showing it for the quality of the light. In this case, it's it's the pattern that is is being created in the in the sand by the wind. Uh, all right, you probably have thought that I haven't done an awful lot with color in terms of photography, and I haven't because most photography that we talk about as fine art photography, uh, most of the 20th century, the individual photographers worked in black and white because that's what they could do in their own dark room. They didn't have access to all the technology to work with color, and of course it's, it's changing now because uh, you know, with digital and everything else, you can you can print your own stuff, and you know, but but then you have to be a little bit of a, a, a computer nerd to to do all the color stuff, get everything done just right. It's you know, but you, or you can take it to the you know the local frame uh, or local. Um,